Young Israel of North Beverly Hills Jewish History Lecture Series and um, an appropriate an appropriate moment to end the Persian era is I guess Rosh Chodesh Adar Adarishon in this elite year but we are now ending the Persian period and we're going to begin the Greek period of Jewish history and the history of Judaism. Before we do that, discuss something which I have threatened to talk about already for two weeks, but I haven't really got to it. But it's important before I do that, usually when I begin the uh, lecture every week, I thank the host. <laughs> Here we are in shul, we thank our host. I, uh, the president, of course, we should thank Philip, but I also would like to take the opportunity of thanking, well, and that's of course the CAMs, who uh, Daryl and Gay, and they really have been. <laughs> we don't see it here on the on the movie, but the food is very good, and we're pleased with that. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, everyone's here for the food. I want to take the opportunity to describe something which is really important. It's important for the development of Judaism. It's important because we need to understand what it means in terms of our faith. And it's something which is absolutely never described or discussed in any context. It's something we take for granted almost by default. This is axiomatic of what it means to be a Jew, that we have something called the Jewish Bible. But it wasn't always so. So what does it mean that we have a canonized Bible? That's what we're going to be discussing, at least in these initial few minutes. First of all, before we even get into the, the canonized Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, Tanakh, whatever you're going to call it, what does the word canon mean? And it's not the big booming gun that people use during wars. The word canon has um, a meaning in terms of theology. This is not a theological lecture as you're going to see, but we have to describe the word canon. In practical terms, it means books which are included, or texts which are included in a set of sacred scriptures. That would be the best way of describing it. For Jews, that's us guys, it means Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Kesuvim. We're going to see what that is in a minute. Gentiles refer to this group of sacred texts as the Old Testament, which means that for them it has the status of the first set of canonized scriptures. There is another set of canonized scriptures. They later on, much later, hundreds of years later, canonized a new set of texts which they called the New Testament and which relates to the formation of their religion at a particular point in history. It's very important that one must understand that at the time that the texts that we know from Tanakh were being written and circulated, there were plenty of other texts in existence of a very similar form almost identical in the way that they read and the way that they sound, but these were not included in the canonized set of scriptures. So they seem similar, they seem like they ought to be included, and if any of you have read, read let's say, the book of Enoch, Chanoch, it's a very interesting book. It sounds very much like some of the other books that we have in Tanakh, but it wasn't included in the final canonized version of our Tanakh. A canonized scripture is a text that's believed to be divinely authored or inspired. I have to stress here to kind of correct a misconception. There is a misconception that all canonized books had to be written at a particular time. And if they were written after a particular time or before a particular time, that's not the case at all. As I said, the book of Enoch was written at the same time as the book of Daniel. And yet, Chanoch is not included in the Tanakh, and Daniel is included in Tanakh. The difference between the two texts is that there was this belief 
that Daniel was somewhat divinely inspired, whatever that means. And I don't think, actually, that this lecture is the place to talk about it. That's why I said it's not a theological subject. For, I mean, it's not a theological lecture, it's a theological subject. I just want to place that on the table. There are theologians, some of them controversial, some of them not, who spend long hours and many pages and gallons of ink describing why they think that a particular book is or is not divinely inspired. That's not the purpose of our lecture series. I'd like really to focus on what these things are and how they form part of our religion, how they became so axiomatic to the Jewish faith. The books that were left out of the canonized scriptures were clearly thought not to have been divinely inspired, and I think that's the important point to take away from this brief introduction. Now, the, um, if I may hand these out. Um, thank you. The Hebrew scriptures are divided into three parts. We're familiar with those three parts. Torah, Levium, Kusuvim. Can you just let me have one? I have to oh, no. retain one copy. They usually described the 24 books of Tanakh. It's a little bit misleading because there are more than 24 books, or let's call them self-contained texts, as you're going to see. So, for example, we have a book, it's number 7 on our list of the 24, and it's called Shoftim. But Shoftim, we know, is divided into two separate books. There's Shoftim Aleph and Shoftim Base. So Shoftim Aleph is a self-contained sacred text, and Shoftim Beis is a self-contained um, sacred text. In fact, if you count all the different self-contained texts or books that we have in Tanakh, you'll find there's actually 39. So 24 is actually 39. I, I give you an example. The thing that really shoots up the numbers is Treoso, which we call the Minor Prophets in English. The Minor Prophets is made up of tre also of 12 separate prophets. Now, we did describe in the first lecture that some of them only have two chapters. Some of the self-contained texts only contain two chapters. Others contain many, many more. Yeshaya is a very long book. And, of course, uh, uh, Malachi is a very short book. But they're all self-contained texts. There's 39 of them. Useful list to have. Um, I'm not going to go through the names here of every one. But let's just hold it in front of you because I am going to be describing something very important now, which is why would one book belong to one of the three divisions and another book belong to another one of the three divisions? Quite an important question. Tanakh, right? Why isn't it all just Torah? How is it that this, was, this group of books, this collection of sacred scriptures was divided into three? So that's really what I want to talk about now. The basic answer is that Tanakh, or the canonization of Tanakh, <coughs> took place at different points in time. So we think that there was this grand synod, <coughs> and all the cardinals came together, and they had a big decision, they took a vote, and they decided all these books are going to belong to Tanakh. That's not how it happened. So there was a point in history at which there was a certain group of books that were considered sacred, but others in existence may be considered sacred or not, but they weren't part of a canonized Bible. That happened at a much later date. Then there was another point in history where another group of books be belonged to that group, but it had a lesser um, a lesser value, or let's say a lesser importance in terms of its canonization, and then a third group of books, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Let's look into those three things. What is the Torah? The Torah, and it's known throughout Tanakh, obviously outside of the first five books, as Torah Moshe. You heard this last week when we described Ezra's sermon, Ezra's redefinition or reintroduction of the Torah to the Jewish people, and this was in the 5th century BCE, he refers to a text called Torah's Moshe. Torah's Moshe was an accepted historical document or group of 
um, books which had been taken on as having um, a canonized uh, um, value in terms of its religious significance. That was Torah's Moshe. Um, it's important to understand that it must have been accepted if no one quibbled with it. So when the book of Ezra came out and referred to him discussing or describing a text called Torah's Moshe and no one objected to it, that means that there was this historical document already in existence and that that historical document was accepted as an authoritative guide of what it meant to be a Jew. Torah's Moshe. That is the first segment of Tanakh, the first five books. We then have something called Nevi'im. What's Nevi'im? The Talmudic sages asserted that prophecy ended when somebody called Alexander the Great, we're going to hear a lot about him a bit later on, Alexander the Great came to the land of Judea, the land of Israel, and as he walked into the land of Israel and took over and the Greek influence came into the land of Israel, prophecy ended. That's what the Talmudic sages Chazal teach us. In effect, this meant the books that were composed before that time could be considered prophetic, prophecy, authored by divinely inspired prophets, Nevi'im, that's what the word Novi is, while all books that were um, composed afterwards, that were put together after that time, could never be considered prophecy, even if they were written by people who were, um, I guess, very holy or very special, or considered leaders of the Jews, religious leaders of the Jews, they couldn't be considered prophets. And therefore, none of those books could ever be considered a candidate to be included in the group of books known as Nevi'im. Okay? This view is supported as follows. There is a conspicuous absence of any later debate in any of the uh, texts that we rely on to give us a sense of what Tanakh is about, um, that, about the Nevi'im, that once they were canonized, that they were considered as such. So, a Novi, if he wasn't considered a Novi, at some point later, there would have been a Talmudic debate as to whether he would have been or should have been considered a Novi. If somebody wouldn't have been considered a Novi, there would have been a rabbinic opinion that would have been cited somewhere in the Talmud to say that this man wasn't a Novi. That's never brought up. We're going to hear there was a massive debate about Yechezkel. But the debate wasn't about whether he was a prophet. The debate was whether his prophecies, which were somewhat controversial, should be included in Tanakh. Because is it appropriate to include the prophecies of somebody whose prophecies could be misinterpreted in a canonized set of scriptures? But no one ever argued about his prophetic vision. Another proof is that there's a lack of Greek words in the prophetic books in the Nevi'im. Um, and that's why, for example, we see um, Daniel, Doniel, and Divrei Hayomim, which do include foreign languages, by the way, not just Greek, they're included in Ketuvim. They're not included in the Nevi'im, even though Daniel lived well before the time of the end of the prophetic period. So you might have thought that Daniel should be included in the prophetic period. What about Ezra and Nehemiah? Remember, we've been studying Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah certainly were living in Eretz Israel long before Alexander the Great turned up. Why aren't they included in Nevi'im? And the answer is because they, these books include Greek words. The Greek words means that they must have been written at a later time, when Greek was a language that was being used in the Holy Land, and as such, they're not candidates to be included in the Nevi'im. But Go ahead. The five books of Moses, Moses is an Egyptian word. Yes, and there are, there are Egyptian words there, but the Egyptian words are not... The Egyptian word, there, by the way, is not just Egyptian words, it's other um, oh, foreign yeah. words which are included in what I described before as Torah to Moshe, but not Greek words. Greek words date the book to a post-Alexander the Great period. An Egyptian word could have been written many hundreds of years earlier, and certainly was, when Egyptian was the language or lingua franca of the Middle East. Ketuvim. Ketuvim is the final section of the Tanakh, 
And that's a very diverse collection. Some of the books which are included in this group must have been composed earlier than the canonization of the, of the Nevi'im section. For example, Tehillim, the Psalms of David. But they're not appropriate to include in the prophetic books of Nevi'im. Um, so why were books, any of the books, included in the Nevi'im and not in one of the others, well, Torah Moshe, we understand, but why weren't they included in the VM? There's three reasons which are potentially the answer to any one of those questions, and each book fits into a different reason. The first reason is that for some of them, their literary form was considered non-prophetic. It's a not a Novi style. For example, Esther or Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a narrative history, or that's the way it's presented, of a particular period in Jewish history. It's not, uh, it's, not, it's not something which is prophecy. Esther is not prophecy. It's a narrative story about Purim. It's not a, it's not a prophecy. So that, as such, they, these books are not appropriate to include in a set of books that are called Nevi'im. For others, they were regarded as having a lesser degree. And I'm going to leave it at that. I said this is not a theological lecture. They have regarded as having a lesser degree of divine inspiration. For example, the Tre Asa, and for example, um, the um, Divrei Hayom. These were books that were not considered to have, in any particular form, divine inspiration. They're very important books in terms of the information that they contain, but they're not important in terms of their divine inspiration, therefore not appropriate to include them in the prophetic books of the Bible. And finally, that some of them were certainly authored after the canon of the Nevi'im was already closed, and I've already mentioned Doniel. So Doniel is about a historical figure who lived long before the Nevi'im period ended, but the book called Doniel was certainly authored after Alexander the Great came to the land of Israel. And as such, it's not appropriate to include it in the group of books that's called a Nevi'im, and that's why it's in the Ketuvim. So you have here three distinct sections of the Hebrew Bible, all canonized, all considered divine in some way or another, but of different levels, and, and they uh, were composed or put together or accepted as such at different times. Let's talk about acceptance of the canon of Tanakh. It's so important to know this information in terms of what it means to be a Jew, we always refer to Tanakh as a kind of, just, it's a group of books and we accept it in a uniform way, but it's not that way at all. Was every book, is the question, was every book that we consider to be part of Tanakh universally accepted immediately to be part of Tanakh? And the answer is definitely not. It's not even a controversial answer. It's an answer which is brought down in Chazal, there's Mishnahs about it, and there's Gomorrahs about it. Absolutely not. So don't think that one day there was a, a knock at the door, or there was this grand meeting of a bunch of rabbis stroking their beards, and they decided all these books have to be accepted by every Jew as being part of Tanakh, otherwise they're not considered normative Jews. Absolutely not. Virtually all the books of the Ketuvim were regarded as canonical, but only by the time of the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, which is 70 CE, 70 of the Christian era, which is roughly 2,000 years ago. So it's hardly a long time ago in terms of the history of the Jewish faith. There were some of those books that had been around for hundreds of years by then, and until that time had not been considered candidates to be included in Tanakh. The canonicity of the following books have been at one point or another the subject of debate, and I tell you again, non-controversial debate. That means no one's going to call me giving this lecture, watching it on YouTube and say, oh, Rabbi Dunn is really controversial because he said these books at one time were not included in Tanakh. Absolutely not. This is recorded in the Jewish faith that these certain books were iffy in terms of their Tanakh status. Which ones are we talking about? Yechezkel, Mishlei, Shira Shirim, Kohelet, and Megillat Esther. Five books at one time or another 
there was a debate as to whether they should be included in Tanakh. So we may have had a Tanakh with not 24 books, but 19. It turned out that these books were eventually included. I am assuming, by the way, I don't have huge amounts of evidence for it, but I'm assuming that there were, even among those who accepted those five books, who are our forebears, there were among those rabbis people who wanted to accept other books in Tanakh and eventually decided not to. So there were certain books whose canonicity was iffy, which were eventually excluded from Tanakh or not included in the Tanakh. That's also important to know that the final group of books that you've got here in front of you is a group of books that took time to decide upon and may have, in fact, excluded certain books that for a time might have made it into the canonized text and then didn't. Non-acceptance did not mean, in other words, that these books were not divine in origin in one way or another. All it meant, possibly, was that they were either theologically dangerous, but probably more accurately, that they weren't essential for the endurance of the Jewish faith. The books that we have in our Tanakh were considered essential texts for us now, living in 2014, to have as source books for our Jewish faith. There were other books which could have been very divine. We know that there were hundreds of prophets who lived in the hundreds of years preceding the closure of the canon whose works were written and circulated. And yet their works were not considered essential components of our faith and that's why they remained outside of it. Not for everyone. Some of those books can be found in various other texts of the Old Testament, like the Greek translation, the Septuagint, which includes various texts which we don't have. There's other bits of Esther. There's other bits of Ezra, which we don't have, which exist in in old manuscripts, and even the Dead Sea Scrolls has various additions or subtractions, omissions I should call them, in terms of the texts that we have. But what we have, and the way it's been given down to us, is the essential texts of the Jewish faith, and at some point that decision was made, and that's what we need to understand about them. We don't need to think that any other text was bad and only our ones are good. We need to think in terms of this is the central text of our faith. Yes, sir? Who, who made these uh, decisions to include or not include these? It's, I'm going to get to that point because that's a, also a very important point. I'm going to get to it. But before I do that, I want to deal with something which is quite well known because it's brought up more than once in the Talmud. Um, and that's the controversy, or controversy as you like to pronounce it in this country, over Yechezkel. Yechezkel is no doubt the most controversial of all the books that was included in the Tanakh. In the Talmud, in Masechet Shabbat, Yud Gimel on the base, 13b, a story is related about a man called Hanania ben Chizkia. Ben Gurion. It's actually a Mishnah. Hananiah ben Chizkiah ben Gurion was one of the most respected rabbinic leaders of his day. And I would say that he lived in the early decades of the first century, before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, after Shammai and Hillel, but around the time of Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, and before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, before the destruction of the Second Temple. And he was faced with a controversial decision. Should the book of Yechezkel be finally included in the canon, or should it be excluded from the canon? And the great religious minds of the time were extremely concerned. And they felt that a decision had to be made because it was causing problems within the Jewish faith. We're going to see why in a minute. And it's a story that's related in the Talmud, and I've heard it repeated in, I guess, 
in a rhetorical sense, many times about the diligence of Talmudic sages, he used up, so the story goes, 300 measures of oil, 300 jugs of oil, 300 cruises of oil. Using the fire from those oil, I guess a kind of the light that he was using to study the text, because he wanted to find a way of explaining all the controversies of Yechezkel in such a way that it could be included in Tanakh, and he was eventually successful. So eventually he managed to resolve all the problems with Yechezkel and we have today Yechezkel included in our Tanakh as a result of the work and the diligence of Hananya ben Chizkiya ben Gurion. If not for him, the Talmud says, the book of Yechezkel would have been hidden away. The words in Hebrew is Nignaz Sefer Yechezkel. But we have Yechezkel. Who was Yechezkel? Why is he so controversial? So by the way, Yechezkel comes before our 700-year period that we've identified as the period we were going to be describing in this series of lectures. Yechezkel lived at the time of the um, expulsions of, Nebuch of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a priest, and he came from the Zadokite uh, priestly clan, and he was one of the 3,000 leadership-level Jews who was exiled to Babylon in the year 597 BCE. So before the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, a whole group of leaders was exiled to Babylon. He went with them. What's wrong with Sefer Yecheskel? Why should Sefer Yecheskel have ever thought, have ever <coughs> been thought to be excluded? It seems a very prophetic book. It's a very profound book. I don't know if you've ever read Yecheskel. I'm sure some of you have seen the Avtoris from Yecheskel, which we have during the year. It's powerful stuff. But what's wrong with it? Why would it not be included? Sefer Cheskel records certain laws, mainly regarding temple procedures and processes, which actually <coughs> contradict the laws of the temple as recorded in Sefer Vayikra, which we said is Torah's Moshe, which has greater significance and weight in terms of the Jewish faith than anything that came after it. So if Sefer Cheskel says, this is the way we did something in the temple, and we know from Torah Moshe, from the Torah, from the five books of the Torah, from Vayikra, that something was done in another way, that's a contradiction that cannot be reconciled easily. That's what Hananya ben Chizkiya ben Gurion was spending all that oil doing. He was trying to find ways of reconciling these differences, which seemed to show that Yechezkel either didn't know what he was talking about, or was recording something in historical terms, which would be troubling to later generations who would see that the Jews had diverted from normative practice. Also, the opening chapters, ch chapters 1 to 3 of Yechezkel, present a detailed and vivid picture of God coming in a chariot, as it were, surrounded by a retinue of angels. And it's described in incredible detail how the angels looked, how God looked. We find that very difficult. Jews find any definition or description of God very difficult. We can't, we can't take that seriously, because as you know, God cannot have a form. God is without form. God is beyond time and space according to the Jewish faith. The monotheistic God of the Jews cannot have any kind of form that can be described so how is it possible that three chapters of Yechezkel is devoted to describing how God looks? That sounds very pagan. That sounds very pagan. And Hananya ben Chizkiya ben Gurion was faced with this challenge. How do we explain these descriptions of God which Yechezkel is putting in his so-called divinely authored text? His Nebiot, his prophecy. And that's what he spent time doing. He wanted to find a way of reconciling Jewish tradition, the Jewish faith, with the first three chapters of Yechezkel. The picture described, by the way, by Yechezkel, is known as Masi Merkava. The Talmud delves in great detail to Masi Merkava. And Masi Merkava is actually the origins of what we call today Kabbalah. So long before 
long before we had any Kabbalistic texts. The people who studied Kabbalah were studying the mysticism associated with Masa Merkaba, with these first three chapters of Yecheskel. A lot of effort was devoted to trying to find the mystical secrets contained in these chapters because they were thought to contain the mysteries of the Jewish faith or the mysteries of God's creation. So, why would Kabbalah have been excluded from the Bible? And the answer is simple. Kabbalah, even to this day, is considered dangerous for the uninitiated. It's a way, perhaps, of feeling close to God without making any commitment to any kind of service of God. It's knowledge without accountability. And therefore, Kabbalah was always something that was frowned upon. We focus much more on doing good, doing the right thing, doing mitzvot, doing the mitzvot that we have to do that we don't understand. Trying to understand the mysteries of God or the mysteries of creation was considered not just a diversion from our true purpose in life, but actually a potentially dangerous threat to the Jewish faith because it couldn't endure beyond the individual. And Kabbalah is therefore something that was often marginalized in the Jewish faith. And this is a concrete example that we see in the Talmud of the potential of a book of Tanakh being excluded from the canon as a result of its Kabbalistic content. So you asked, good question, who decided which 24 or 39, whichever number you're going to use, books, which 24 texts are going to be included in Tanakh? And I have to tell you, I'm often asked this question when I give this particular lecture or this, I talk about this subject. And the question you're really asking, although you're not articulating it that way, but the question I'm really being asked is, why did the people who canonized Tanakh have that authority? Who gave them the authority to decide that this book should be included and that book shouldn't be included? Why can't I now revisit that decision and decide that a particular book should have or should not have been canonized? just because they lived 2,000 years ago? What makes them no more than something that I may find out or know? And the answer is complex, but I'm going to simplify it. While it is true to say that Chazal had a big hand, the sages had a big hand in deciding what books should or should not be considered <coughs> part of Tanakh, ultimately, the canonical debate in Judaism was resolved not by any authoritative body. That's not the way it went at all. It was the result of a consensus of the Jewish people, and by that I mean those who subscribed to rabbinic Judaism, or what we refer to as normative Judaism. There was a consensus, an organic belief, yes, that these books are the ones that make sense for us as the people are going to carry forward the Jewish faith, and those books don't make sense for us. Nobody was standing there with a stick when somebody was holding a particular book and saying, that book you're not allowed to use. No one ever forget, forbade the book of Hanukkah or the um, book of Maccabees from being held in a Jewish home. No one ever said you're not allowed to have these books, they're forbidden. No, but these books are not to be included in Tanakh. They're not to be considered the texts of the Jewish faith. That's an organic decision that wasn't reached by a particular group of people or a particular person. And in that sense, the Tanakh that we have now is the result of a process that was eventually crystallized into the 24 books or the 39 self-contained texts that we have and that we call the canonized Hebrew scriptures. With that, I'm going to end my talk on this particular subject and move to the next subject. You know, we're speeding through 700 years. We are almost three quarters of the way through 
a lecture. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get through all the material I have to get through in the next uh, 20 minutes and then the hour that I have next week. With your permission, I may call on you for another hour on the following week after next week's lecture because otherwise I don't think I'll be able to get through all the material and you'll forgive me as will the viewers. You wanted to ask a question? Just based on the authorities that we read um, of Ezekiel, he's the most futuristic. Uh, he could have been writing science fiction from the eyes of a primitive person uh, without... The In a literary sense, Yecheskel is beautiful and descriptive and the things that he writes about are things, and I think we've discussed them before, mm -hmm. are, are almost, as you say, science fiction. Well, he's anticipating things that exist now at a time that we know that, unless you believe in the chariots of the gods, uh, pieces, uh, that the earth was visited, that's where we know all these religions and other things, by other more advanced uh, civilizations that touched earth. But Ezekiel yes. is describing things that... It's full of powerful visions, powerful visions and interesting visions that don't seem to chime with the Time. era in which he was contemporary. Let's move on. Hellenism and Hellenization in Judea. And we're jumping forward now at the end of the Persian era to the year 332 BCE. First of all, what is Hellenism? You've heard me use the term, you've probably seen it in the emails that I've been sending you about the lectures which you're about to hear. But what is Hellenism? What is Hellenization? I'm going to give you an abbreviated definition. It's a devotion to, or an imitation of, classical Greek thought, customs, and styles. That is it. If, you want to, if anybody wants me to send them... That sentence in an email, that's what Hellenization is. Yes, there's people who've written long monographs and even books on the subject. That's really essentially people who wanted to imitate the Greeks in their thought, cultural style were Hellenized. And Hellenism was the attempt to do that. This cultural phenomenon swept through the ancient world as a result of the dominance of the Greek Empire, particularly because of Alexander the Great, who we'll hear about in a moment. And it continued, interestingly enough, when the Roman Empire took over the Greek, Greek Empire a couple of hundred years later. So they more or less adopted Hellenism as their national culture, which is a very unusual thing to happen because the Babylonians were taken over by the Persians and then Persian culture took over. And the Greeks took over from the Persians and then the Greek culture took over, but the Romans never had a culture of their own. They just adopted the Greek culture and ever since that time, there's, there's been this tension between the Hebrew origins of the Bible and elements of that culture and the Greek Hellenized culture of the Greek Empire. And that tension exists to this day even in the Western world. Hellenism was introduced to Judea after it was captured by Alexander the Great in 332 and its effects perpetuated for many centuries. Now, who was Alexander the Great? I bet you've all heard his name. Let's talk a little bit about him to find out who he was. Alexander of Macedon, or Macedonia, was known in Jewish sources as Alexander Mukdan or Mukdan. That's the way he's defined in the Talmud. And he was born in 356 BCE. And he died at a very young age, a tender age of 32, in 323 BC. He was Alexander III. He wasn't even Alexander I. He's important to us because of his effect of history and his domination of a huge amount of land at that particular time. So in those last few years of his life, he um, took over almost the entire known world. He reigned as a king from the year 336 until his death, so just for 13 years. We always think of him very positively, but if you read the history books, the man was a ruthless killer. He was a militaristic man who would often go into cities and if he felt there was any resistance there, he would kill everybody, man, woman and child, or he would kill all the leaders in the most horrific and gruesome ways. This was not a man who shrunk or was shrinking away from doing the most gruesome and violent stuff 
to ensure that he would win the battles that he needed to win to take over the lands that he wished to take over. After numerous ruthless victories in his unstoppable conquest to conquer and gain control of the ailing Persian Empire, Alexander arrived in Judea in the year 332. I'm going to show you, if I may, they're on opposite sides of the page. I may just give this... Thank you, Daniela. I'm going to keep one. These are two descriptions of Alexander the Great arriving in Judea in 332. One of them in Josephus, one of them in the Talmud that it's taken from Megillat Tanit. They're very similar but different. They're written contemporaneously around the same time. And what's so interesting is how similar they are. So obviously the legends that existed about his first encounter with the Jews was something which prevailed. But what's interesting, of course, as well is the difference. It's, a, it's in England you call it Chinese whispers. So the names change and the places change and the circumstances change ever so slightly, but over time those slight differences mean a divergence of the actual story. So on the part from Josephus, it's taken from chapter 11. I've slightly reworked the translation from William Whiston's classic translation of Josephus. So here we see the high priest is called Jadua. He heard that, he heard that Alexander was coming up to Jerusalem. He was in agony and under terror as he did not know how he should meet the Macedonians since the king was displeased at his previous disobedience. Clearly, Jadua had done something, or the Jews had done something wrong. There was this feeling that when Alexander the Great would come, arrive in Jerusalem, there would be a mass slaughter of either the entire city, or at least of the leading citizens. When it became clear, I'm just reading the highlighted text, when it became clear that Alexander was not far from the city, Jadua went out in procession with the priests and all the citizens. He went out and he was in his full... Um, uniform as the high priest. Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance, in white garments, so all the Kohanim were wearing their big day kahuna, their white garments, while the priest stood clothed in fine linen, and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, he looked in his finest robes with his mitre on his head, having the golden plate on which the name of God was engraved, he approached on his own. This is Alexander. And he worshipped the name of God and greeted the high priest. So this encounter, which could have been such a disaster for the Jews, turned out to be wonderful because Alexander was showing respect to the Kohen Gadol, who in this narrative is referred to as Jadua. And the people who were with Alexander were clearly expecting to have a very good time in Jerusalem. The Temple of Jerusalem was known for its riches. It was plundered many times afterwards. And they were expecting Alexander the Great to do what he'd done in so many other cities. By the way, what he did in Gaza. He went into Gaza and he tore the place apart. He killed everybody in sight. And yet when he came to Jerusalem, he was busy hugging and kissing and showing respect to the high priest. And they were fairly surprised. Parminio went up to him and asked him, how come when all others worshipped him, he had worshipped the high priest of the Jews? Alexander replied, I did not worship him, I worship the God who has honoured him with his high priesthood. For when I was considering how I would obtain the dominion of Asia, when I was at Dios in Macedonia, I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit. And it was he who told me not to delay, but to boldly travel over the sea. And he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. And I have not seen any other person in that habit. And now seeing this person in it and remembering that vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I am bringing this army under divine supervision and I shall conquer Darius and destroy, and destroy the power of the Persians and that all things will succeed as I am planning. The narrative continues, but turn the page and let's see how the Talmud refers to this incredible meeting between the leader of the Jews essentially, the high priest was the leader of the Jews, and the leader of the conquering, the marauding Greek army. It was taught 
The 25th of Tevet is the day of Mount Gerizim, on which no mourning is permitted. It is the day when the Kuthians, the Samaritans, demanded the house of our God from Alexander the Macedonian so as to destroy it. And he had given them the permission to do so. Whereupon some people came and informed the high priest, Simon the Righteous, Shimon HaTzadik. This is almost certainly not the Shimon HaTzadik that we know of a later period and who we're going to be describing. And there's a confusion here over the name. The name given in Josephus is Jadua. And the name given here is Shimon HaTzadik. But clearly the name isn't known. What we do know is that the high priest was informed that Alexander the Great was about to arrive in Jerusalem and that either he was minded to kill the Jews or he'd given permission to a bunch of other people to kill the Jews. So what did Shimon HaTzadik do? He robed himself in his priestly garments, I guess of scarlet and gold as described by Josephus, and together with some of the noblemen of Israel who carry fiery torches in their hands, they walked all night and they walked towards Alexander the Great. It's the same story, but told slightly differently. When the dawn rose, Alexander said to the Samaritans, having spotted the approaching party, who are these people? They answered, these people are the Jews who rebelled against you. In other words, these are the people you're letting me kill. And it, of course, echoes the story as told by Josephus, because Josephus said that Jadul was very scared because previously there had been some conflict between him and the aims of Alexander the Great, and he was convinced that Alexander the Great was about to come and conquer Judea and kill him. When Alexander saw Shimon HaTzadik, he descended from his carriage and bowed down before him. It's a little bit more dramatic than the version in Josephus. The Samaritans said to him, a great king like yourself should bow down before this Jew. Again, the same question being asked as was asked in the version by Josephus. And the answer Alexander gave was, it is his image that wins all my battles for me. So this legend of the Kohen Godel having appeared to Alexander the Great and is having seen him and therefore he respects him finally when he meets him in person is a legend that is prevalent in the Jewish sources both Josephus Megillus Tanis later brought down in the Gomorrah. I don't know of a Greek version of the tale but I do know that in Jewish tradition Alexander the Great is not considered an evil marauding conqueror, but he's considered a liberator. He's considered a great man, as evidenced by the fact that we have adopted the name Alexander in our tradition. We use that name, and the very first Alexanders were named for Alexander the Great, even in his lifetime, by Jews who lived at that time in Judea. That wouldn't be possible, of course, had Alexander the Great mistreated the Jews. And it would seem that at least the forebears of our Jewish tradition, of our Jewish faith, were treated well by Alexander. And as we will see, they were treated well by his successors, at least until the time of Hanukkah. <coughs> now, Alexander the Great died nine years later, in the year 323 BCE. He died very suddenly. And if you look at uh, secular historians' description of his death, it's been one of those uh, puzzles that so many people have been busy with. We've got no idea why he died. We don't have any record. It could have been a stomach infection. It could have been that he was poisoned. It could have been any one of a multitude of reasons. We don't have any blood tests. We don't have any, any evidence to know why he died. We just know that he died. He was 32 years old, and by that time he'd conquered a vast tract of territory and he left a bunch of very fractious generals to take charge, all of whom took bits of his empire and took control of that bit and didn't like any of the other generals. There were five bits. There were five separate tracts of land that were taken control of by the generals that succeeded Alexander the Great. But there's only two which are relevant to us. There was a general called Ptolemy, he took over Egypt, and another general called Seleucus, and he took over Syria, roughly the area of Syria. He goes, of course, in Lebanon, and there's other areas as well, but roughly modern Syria and modern Egypt. 
These were two very important pieces of land. Guess which little annoying country fell right in between these two warring countries? The land of Judea. The land occupied by a very tenacious and a very proud people. The Jewish people who weren't about to give up on their religion and their faith, however Hellenized they were. And they were an annoying thorn in the side of these two generals. And over the period of the first few years after the death of Alexander the Great, the land of Judea swapped hands between these two warring factions, these two warring generals, five times. And only eventually, only eventually, did the Ptolemaic Empire take over the land of Judea. And that was, of course, the Egyptian general and his successors, all of them who carried the name Ptolemy. There were no longer any pharaohs. Every ruler of Egypt was of Greek origin from then on, spoke Greek. When we hear about the great city of Alexandria, that wasn't an Egyptian city, it was a, it was a Greek city. Everything about Egypt in those days was Greek and Hellenized. There may have been peasants and agricultural workers and people who lived there who weren't Greek, but the land was controlled by the Greeks. And they took over the land of Judea and they ruled it from 301, so roughly 20 years after the death of Alexander the Great. They ruled it for over a century, over a century, till 198 BCE. The Seleucid rule over Judea was much shorter was from 198 until 164. We're going to learn why. What happened during the Ptolemaic period? They controlled Judea for a century. You know what? Not much is known about that period in terms of the historical development of the Jews. We don't know much about the Jews at that time. We know what was going on. We know because there's something called the Xenon Papyri. Another collection of manuscripts that's been discovered, an archive of manuscripts. And it's a collection of administrative documents from the archives of the Egyptian finance minister of that period. Well, it's a very important set of documents. A lot of money changed hands, taxes being collected, money's being paid. You can learn about roads being built, wars being fought, and all the things that one would expect to find in the uh, books of a finance ministry, but not much about the religious development, not much about the faith of the people. You don't see much about faith if you look at annual accounts. So we don't know much about the development of Judaism at that time. Judea, we do know, was governed by a Kohen Gadol. By that time, the system had crystallized. There were ruling priestly families, and the head Kohen, who was chosen periodically, became the high priest. And he was not just the high priest in terms of his formal role in the temple. He was also the leader of the Jews, the political leader of the Jews. If anybody wants to negotiate with the Jews, who did they go to? The Kohen Gadol. If anybody wanted to tax the Jews, much more important. Everybody wants money, right? You want to tax the Jews, who do you go to? The Kohen Gadol. If anybody wants to impose some rules on the Jews, who do they go to? The Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol was the leader of the Jews and he was treated as such by all the surrounding powers and in particular the rulers in Egypt who turned to him as their client ruler of the client state of Judea. Now, I want to stress that Greek culture became ever more evident and prominent in this period with a wide, and you should know this, the wide and willing cooperation and participation of the Jewish population. Don't think for one second that any Jew was dragged kicking and screaming into being Hellenized. Absolutely not. This was the way you did business. If you could speak Greek, and if you appeared as a Greek, and if you knew what the Greek world, the Greek empire wanted, what type of food they wanted you to grow so that they would buy it, what type of silverware they used so that you could manufacture it and sell it, what type of money they used. And hopefully next week I'm going to bring my collection of Greek era 
Judean coins, you had to be able to participate in the wider Greek empire. You couldn't be an isolationist. And how could you participate in the Greek empire? The only answer was to become a fully Hellenized member of the Greek empire. So if anybody ever tells you that the Jews wanted to retain their Judaism and were reluctant and very reluctant and somewhat reluctant and could have been reluctant in terms of their wanting to become Greek or Hellenized, they're misleading you. The Jews willingly participated in the Greek Empire and they willingly became ever more Greek in their dress, in their language and in everything that they did. Now, from the year 221 BCE, so roughly 20, 25 years before they actually gained control, the Seleucid Empire were desperately trying to get control of Judea. Maybe it was the ports, maybe it's because they wanted to be more threatening to Egypt. But either way, Judea became a crucial a strategic target for the Seleucid Empire. There was a man called Antiochus III, He's the father of the evil man of Hanukkah, who we're going to learn something about. Invaded Judea unsuccessfully in 221. 20 years later, following the death of a very significant king called Ptolemy IV Philopater, and um, he was an interesting man, he died in the year 203. Two years later, Antiochus III invaded Judea again, and he took control at least of part of Judea, <laughs> They finally took complete control in the year 198 BCE, a very important date in Jewish history, because as a result of the Seleucid or the Syrian Greek Empire taking over Judea, eventually it would mean that the Jews would regain control of their own destiny through the Hasmonean dynasty and the famous story of Hanukkah. I'm going to leave it here for today because it's a good moment to break and Next week we're going to begin with the incredible events that led to the story of Hanukkah and the Hasmonean revolt and the revolution that took place as a, as a result of that revolt and the incredible machinations between the various rulers and leaders of both the Egyptian and the Syrian Greek Empire in terms of the Jewish people.